Hello everybody and welcome to the second episode of our podcast interview series hosted by the Center for Manuscript and Text Cultures at the Queen's College, University of Oxford. My name is Gabriela Rota, I'm a research fellow in Classics at Queen's and today I'm very happy to be interviewing a member of the advisory board of our centre. We're still in Cambridge and our interviewee is Professor Moise Nivoyana. Moise is Professor of Celtic and Medieval Studies at the University of Cambridge and a fellow of St John's College. Good morning, Moise, and thank you very much for joining us. How are you today? You're welcome. I'm very well. Thanks very much. Wonderful, Moise. It's so good to have you here. All right, I should say a few things beforehand for our listeners, so please bear with me for a moment. The interview will consist of three consecutive sections which will be duly signposted as we go along. So we're talking about the general section to warm up, followed by two sections on two major aspects of Moise's research on Irish literature and culture. I would like to stress that the focus on Irish literature is my own deliberate choice. The fact is that Moise's research is so broad that I couldn't really find a way of including it all in a single interview. Okay, Moise, thank you very much for your patience. So let's begin with the first section of the interview. Here we go. All right, Moise, first section then, and first question, here it comes. Let's begin with a personal question, if you don't mind. So, you were born, went to school and went to the university in Ireland before moving to other places in Europe, and lastly, to Cambridge. So, I wanted to ask you, did your Irish roots have an impact on your post-school education and career? Did they work, you know, as an encouragement, as an inspiration, or what else to tell us? Well, I suppose, yes, in the sense that I chose well, Irish language and literature is one of the four subjects that I did in first year um, in the BA course I took at University College Cork. But actually at the time I thought I was going to focus on English and history in the second and third years. But when I was there, I discovered the world of medieval Irish, which isn't actually part of the school curriculum in Ireland. I'd grown up obviously hearing some of these stories. My father in particular was very interested in Irish history and literature. And I grew up speaking Irish at home, but in a completely English speaking area. But nonetheless, the rich kind of written literature and history of medieval Ireland was really only properly opened up to me in University College Cork at the hands of inspiring teachers there who also introduced me to the wonderful complexities of old Irish and indeed Welsh, Scots Gaelic. And I suppose the other thing was that those same teachers, particularly Moira Herbert and Paul Gregorian, also inspired me to study elsewhere. So when I finished my degree with the aid of this wonderful Irish scholarship called a travelling studentship, I studied in Germany where I did Scandinavian medieval history and Indo-European. And then I spent a year in Abrustwith doing some more Welsh and indeed learning Breton. And I think that was a really wonderful intellectual opportunity because I actually could follow my curiosity, read and learn things that I didn't have the opportunity to do before, like Sanskrit, Icelandic and these kinds of things. It actually was very, very good preparation for the job I ended up getting in Cambridge. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Well, I must confess that I feel kind of embarrassed every time I ask that question. Thing is, when I applied for an undergraduate degree in classics, I didn't know what I was doing. Still don't know why I did it. Kind of makes sense now, but it didn't make sense at all back then. Anyways, that's just me rambling. Let's move on to another university-related question. So, among our listeners, there may be potential applicants for an undergraduate degree in Anglo-Saxon Norse and Celtic studies. So, Moise, do university programs expect applicants to have prior knowledge of, you know, modern Irish, old Irish or other Celtic or Germanic languages? Uh, I very much hope that there are potential applicants for Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic among your listeners. And we don't expect any prior knowledge at all of any of the languages and literatures we do, be it uh, Old English, Welsh, Norse or indeed Irish. I mean, what we expect, I suppose, what we want are people who are genuinely interested in the Middle Ages and discovering these wonderful literatures, history and learning languages. But we don't expect any prior knowledge at all. And they come to us with a range of interests, students and then I hope that we inspire them in different directions and they go and shape their own individual course of learning within the degree that is Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic. Okay, but how strong is the linguistic component as opposed to cultural, historical or, you know, literary aspects? How strong is the linguistic component throughout the undergraduate course at Cambridge, at your university? So students have a choice in their first year out of 10 papers, 10 courses, they choose six 
And those courses involve, obviously, all of the languages, so Old English, Old Norse, what we call Insular Latin, so Latin as spoken and written in Britain and Ireland in the Middle Ages, Medieval Irish, Medieval Welsh. So they can choose those alongside some history courses and indeed a course on paleography and manuscript studies, which is, of course, also key to the programme. So they have a free choice among those 10, but all of our students would do some language. I mean, if you're interested in the Middle Ages, indeed, if you're interested in the ancient world, as you know, you can only get so far and not really very, very far without looking at the sources in the original language. So all of our students would do some language. Some of them might do one language combined with five other courses. Some of them do five languages. So again, it really just depends on where their interest lies. And our language papers are language and literature papers. So you're learning the language, but also reading the literature, studying the literature at the same time. And then in the third year at the advanced level, as well as doing languages at a more advanced level, uh, we also introduce uh, philology papers. So one on Germanic philology, the other on Celtic philology, which again, explores the relationship between various different languages. So I think in a way, what we try to do is balance those historical, cultural, literary aspects alongside the linguistic ones. But our aim really is to give students a rounded, detailed, thorough, authentic experience really of learning about the Middle Ages. Wonderful, Moise. In fact, I could not agree more with your notion of language. Without the language, the culture stays there, you know. We cannot really access it. That no doubt applies to modern languages too, but it is absolutely crucial for pre-modern cultures because we do not really have an easy access to those cultures. The Romans, the Greeks, and people from medieval Ireland are all dead, you see. So language is our access, and we are completely at a loss without it. Fine, Moje, let me add an appendix to the question you just answered. So, based on your own first-hand personal experience, are there any substantial differences between how Irish and Celtic studies are taught in Ireland and in Britain? Irish is taught in Ireland as part of a department generally that teaches all stages of Irish from the Middle Ages down to the modern age. So it's a very, very different kind of approach to the approach we have in Cambridge, where medieval Irish is taught as part of an integrated study of the early cultures of Britain and Ireland. So in our degree programme, we focus very much on the Middle Ages. We're lucky enough to have actually some teaching in modern Irish in the department funded by a wonderful grant, which we've had now for more than 10 years from the Irish government. And they fund the teaching of modern Irish. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Margot Griffin-Wilson teaches that. So we're lucky here in in Cambridge, as I say, to have some modern Irish teaching. We also have some modern Icelandic teaching as well alongside the Old Norse teaching, but that's supplementary in a wonderful way to the core medieval aspect of the department. So that I think is really the main difference in Ireland. Um, as I say, if you learn about medieval Ireland, you do so within a context that can take you on further as well. Whereas here, I suppose we're looking outwards really and situating medieval Celtic things in a broader insular and European context. Well, to me, at least both formats seem to work splendidly. I guess it's a matter of different approaches, you know, different academic traditions, different cultural backgrounds, different teaching methods, things like that. Okay, terrific Moishe, now let's turn from school to history in our next question. Pre-modern Ireland is commonly imagined as a remote and inaccessible place, and isolation is often been used as a category for defining Ireland down to the present day. So, here's my question for you. What do we actually know about the earliest events of Irish history and especially about the emergence of writing, which, as you know, is one of the chief interests of our research cluster. It's absolutely right and proper that we should focus on writing. The written culture of Ireland was very much bilingual from the start. We have Ogham inscriptions, so inscriptions on stone monuments that were there at least from the 4th century, probably between the 4th century and the 7th centuries of the Common Era. And that Ogham alphabet, as we call it, that was shaped certainly by somebody who was familiar with Latin and perhaps Latin grammars of the fourth century. But of course, writing as we know it came with Christianity in the fifth century. And very quickly, the Latin alphabet was adapted to write Irish, to write the vernacular as well. 
The earliest extant manuscripts are very much predominantly in Latin, but they have glosses, they have marginalia, indeed they sometimes have longer passages of text in Irish too. So it's those early documents that really give us some insight into the earliest events in Ireland that we can capture our 5th century Latin documents by St. Patrick. And then jumping on later in the 7th century, we have Lives of St. Patrick, where the St. Patrick that emerges is very much a different figure from the more humble, retiring person that we get in the earliest writings in the 5th century by St. Patrick himself. Wow, thanks a lot for the very rich answer. Okay, let's talk about the different kind of writing now. We could say that manuscripts are the most spectacular product of medieval Irish culture, right? These are not only culturally important, at the time, the early Middle Ages, in which culture had stopped being a priority in the continent, manuscripts are not only culturally important, I was saying, some of them are also lavishly decorated. I for once still remember my excitement when, as a teenager, I was first shown a page of the wonderful Book of Kells. And, indeed, if any of our listeners have never seen the Book of Kells, do look it up online, it does look amazing, you'll be grateful for the suggestion. Alright, Moshe, let's get back on track now. I'm going to ask you a two-fold question, so do expect the first half first. Were there any differences in the contexts and ways in which manuscripts were produced depending on the language in which they were written? So, you know, were there any conspicuous differences depending on whether a manuscript was written in Irish or in Latin, for example? Basically, the texts that have come down to us, down to the 12th century, whether they're in Latin or in Irish, were all written in ecclesiastical centres. So it doesn't matter what the content of those texts were, whether they be secular, you know, legal, but genealogical, historical or whatever, the centres of learning were ecclesiastical. So the script in which both languages were written, Latin and Irish is the same, so similar contractions, similar suspension strokes, that kind of thing. Of the writing of Irish was very much developed within the cradle of Latin literacy, and the Latin alphabet was used to present it. And when we look at those very early, predominantly Latin manuscripts we have, they're mainly religious, they're mainly grammatical. So Latin has primacy in that sense, but that in no way means that Irish was considered secondary language. In fact, an early grammatical tract known as the Poet's Primer puts Irish very deliberately on a par with Latin. So, you know, the author tells us, well, Latin has declensions, so has Irish, Latin has three genders, so has Irish, that kind of thing. And that particular text only survives in later manuscripts, but the language would point to it having been written at least in part around the year 700. So this kind of early period, more Latin is being written than Irish, but certainly Irish is being cultivated as a self-confident literary language as well. Fantastic, fantastic. If I may interject for a moment, Moje, did these linguistic differences change over time, or did they remain the same pretty much all the way through the Middle Ages? What is it, you know, what is it that changed? In a way, what changed was that, like in other places, the amount of writing in the vernacular increased. And there's quite a lot from medieval Ireland at a very early period, but there's no doubt that the ninth century saw a significant change in that direction. But still, this increased amount of writing in the vernacular, this flourishing of the vernacular, still took place in these ecclesiastical centres of learning, which were, of course, absolutely linked to the political powers that be. You know, kings would come to monasteries to ask for origin legends to be written or genealogies to be written. But again, the vernacular increased in popularity, but Latin continues to be written, and again, the same script continues to be used. I suppose when things maybe really begin to change is from the 12th century onwards, we have evidence of secular material in particular being written by professional learned families. So there were legal families that were concerned with writing legal material, there were medical families, there were poetic families. So particularly after the introduction of new religious orders into Ireland in the 12th century, there we certainly see a change. Latin continues to be used and there are quite a number of texts translated from Latin and other languages as well in this period. But I think one of the key things about early medieval Irish intellectual culture is the fact that this learned culture is in this ecclesiastical Latinate embrace for so long. Wow, excellent, Moshe. That was a wonderful answer. Thank you. Okay, I said this would be a truthful question, so here comes the second half of it. How much of the message that the Irish manuscript as a book conveys goes through non-textual features such as, you know, 
the manuscript itself or its illumination, for example? Uh, Non-textual features are really important and haven't always been given enough attention, I think, especially by textual scholars such as myself. Size is important. You mentioned the Book of Kells a minute ago. I mean, the Book of Kells is one of these wonderful, illuminated, imposing gospel books. So demonstration of wealth, power, it's a lavish, luxurious volume. This and others like it is very much a book for display. And that's indicated obviously simply by the illustration, but it's also indicated by the script, this majuscule script, which is used in those kinds of volumes. But not all gospel books are like that. There are also so-called pocket gospel books, like the Book of Dimmer or the Book of Moling, for example. They're about half the size of the Book of Kells and the type of script is different. They use insular minuscule. So even without reading a word of what's in a book, you can actually get a sense of what it's all about. Or indeed, in other cases, if you look at the hierarchy of scripts on a page, that can give you some sense of how a manuscript was used. Again, we're not talking about engaging in any detailed way with what that script actually says. So psalm books are an example of that. Well, I might mention the Southampton Psalter, a book written in Ireland about the year 1000, but the earliest manuscript of St. John's College, Cambridge. And that has scriptural material in one type of script and it's got explanatory material in another. So again, just by looking at the visual aspect of the page, you get a sense of that. Or indeed, we could look at the different ways that scribal hands in the manuscript interact with one another. Again, this isn't about looking at the content, but just looking physically at how different scribes are interacting with one another and that can give us some sense of cooperation, how scribes were coming together to write this particular book or things like how prose and poetic material are set out. Again, we're thinking there about form rather than content. So in the earliest vernacular manuscripts we have from medieval Ireland from the 12th century, syllabic poetry comes to be set out as such. So the stanza structure comes to be marked for the first time and we could take this as an indication of reading practices. Again, we're not talking about content, we're just talking about the visual layout. So a manuscript reveals itself in its layout, in the script, in the illustrations. We can get so many insights into various aspects of it and including things like dry point glosses, which are very, very difficult to see. So I absolutely agree that just the non-textual aspects of a manuscript are hugely significant. But I think what's most important is that we take the non-textual and the textual aspects together because it's only by seeing all of these various strands of a book that we can try to glean the best possible understanding of it. Well said, Moise. And yeah, I could not agree more with your last point. I really think that's the key to a proper understanding of the manuscript as an all-round book, as a thing of its own, right? Now, to make a somewhat related point, manuscripts would not exist if it were not for the scribes who copied them. So, how would you illustrate the engagement of Irish scribes with the text that they were copying? Could you perhaps, you know, single out a specific case that clearly documents this kind of engagement so that our listeners will know more exactly what we're talking about? What most manuscripts indicate is active engagement with the material that they copied. So we might think about them as author scribes, really, rather than simply scribes. I suppose I can choose some examples, but the examples would be different depending on the actual time period. If we look at an example perhaps from the early period, so the period of these heavily glossed Latin manuscripts, a revealing example I think would be a 9th century manuscript now in St. Gaul in Switzerland. It has a copy of Prisham's Grammar. It's in Latin, but it has about maybe nine and a half thousand glosses and three and a half thousand of those glosses are in Irish. And what's interesting is that some of them are in a mixed language. So those glosses, of course, give us a real indication of how the scribes were interpreting the material. Other interesting things about this manuscript is that there's some Greek in it, so the scribes use Greek script. They also have a couple of glosses in that Ogham alphabet that I mentioned at the beginning of this interview. And again, this indicates learnedness, playfulness in all kinds of ways. There are some significant marginalia in this particular manuscript. It's St. Gaul 904. There's quite a well-known stanza of vernacular poetry at the top of one particular page where a scribe in this beautiful, polished, metrical quatrain is rejoicing in the stormy sea. And the reason he's rejoicing in a stormy sea is because Vikings can't cross that night. So I suppose that particular manuscript exemplifies scribes' learning, but also their kind of humanity. So it um, really gives 
gives us an insight into active engagement with the material that they're copying, which for the most part in this particular manuscript is Christian. I mean, that's one from that 8th, 9th century early period. If we jump to the 12th century, where there are a number of large compilatory vernacular manuscripts, there's one very famous scribe involved in the earliest of those manuscripts. It's called Yaron Nahija, the Book of the Dun Cow. And one of the scribes who's called H, he's called H because of the homilies that he added to this particular manuscript. But he also removed, rubbed out some other material and added some material from versions of text that he had himself. So that really is very active engagement in what you have in front of you. And what he was doing was reworking material that had been written there mainly by two earlier scribes in this manuscript that we call A and M. Those are two different kinds of examples, but I hope that they give a sense of how these scribes were creating and consciously reworking and actively engaged with this material. Yes, indeed they do. And uh, as you might remember, I'm working on interpolation at the moment, so I've come to understand on a double level this kind of engagement. You know, it happens quite often in classical texts that scribes are responsible for interpolation in very creative and original ways. And I really like that. I think that's admirable. It shows dedication to the text over the centuries. I do find it beautiful, really. Okay, I'm getting too sentimental. It's getting ridiculous, actually. So let's move on to the next question on schedule instead. What strikes me about Irish medieval culture is the convergence of different and unrelated backgrounds, right? Mainly pre-Christian, Christian, and, of course, classical. So could you tell us more about how this tangled heritage came together? and about the short and long-term effects of the coexistence resulting from that encounter. That's a very entangled question in its own right. It's clear that there was rich pre-Christian material there. What's much more difficult is for us to actually ascertain what form that might have taken, because the material that has come down to us is obviously material from early Christian Ireland, because it was written in an alphabet that came to Ireland with Christianity. So first and foremost, the texts that have come down to us were written in this Christian milieu. I mean, what's absolutely extraordinary is the extent to which medieval Irish learned scholars in the early Christian period engaged with their past and wanted to incorporate pre-Christian deities into the literature they were producing at the time. But that's a literature produced for a Christian audience. So I think we always have to remember that the kind of information we get about pre-Christian material is through a Christian lens, what these learned authors wanted to present about that pre-Christian past. And of course, in shaping that material, they were influenced by the totality of their learning. And like elsewhere in medieval Europe, they were reading the Church Fathers, they were reading all kinds of classical histories. And this kind of material was also shaping what they were writing. Very many of them, as you know, were travelling to and from centres of Carolingian Europe at a relatively early period. So the totality of their learning fed into this rich material that has come down to us. So we have to take it like that. We have to take it as a total unit. We can't, you know, look at these texts and say, ah, there's a pre-Christian God, I can isolate that. So we have to read all of the motifs, all of the themes within the context in which this material was composed. And we have to also think about not just the background of those who were composing it, but also, of course, the audiences, the Christian audiences for whom this material was being written as well. Oh, that was fantastic, Moja. Thank you very much for unraveling so much complexity in one single answer. Okay. As we said, this was the last question of our first section, so after a break, we're now moving on to the second section of our interview, Moise. And we're back! We're back to talk about landscapes, Moise. And the reason why we're talking about landscapes in the second section of our interview is because you're the principal investigator of a brand new five-year research project funded by the Levelhume Trust. The project is on literary topography in medieval Ireland. We could summarize the ethos of the project as follows. Getting to know the space around us as a way of getting acquainted with our collective past. If that makes sense at all, I hope it does. Anyway, we will be discussing the details of your project in a moment, but let's start with a general question, if you don't mind. 
So, Moise, there was no COVID-19 pandemic in sight when you applied for funding for this project, whereas you started the research at the beginning of the so-called second wave of the pandemic in October 2020. So, in this sense, it must have felt like contemplating completely different worlds, right? Anyway, in your project you connect different notions such as, you know, place, belonging and identity. So, without further ado, here's my question for you. The 21st century mobility, in terms of, you know, travel wherever you like, but also, more seriously, the migrant crisis, did all of this contemporary emphasis on mobility induce you to think differently about the key themes of your project? And, conversely, what was the impact of the harsh limitations on mobility that we all had to face in the past year? And, in a sense, that's the reason why we're not having this interview in person, right? That's why you're in Cambridge and I'm in Germany and we're having to do this thing through Zoom, which is fine, but it's not, you know, it's not ideal for a variety of reasons. Anyway, I hope you got the gist of my question, which was very long indeed, and yeah, feel free to answer whenever you're ready. I suppose, well, if I may take the second part of your question first, the first part of the project is transcribing manuscripts. It's transcribing manuscripts, thinking about the meaning of text. So, of course, the wonderful digital resources now available for so many of the manuscripts means that we can actually just still do that, indeed, from our own home. So travel restrictions in that sense haven't affected what we do. Of course, if they continue much longer, they will affect it because not all of the manuscripts have been digitised and even those that have obviously would have to be checked in person. I suppose where it has maybe, where that travel restriction part of it has influenced us as a team, we miss exchanging thoughts and ideas face to face. But of course, we haven't yet done anything else in this project. Actually, the three team members, one of them's in California, the other's in Germany, and of course, I'm here in Cambridge. So we absolutely need to think about the timing of our weekly meetings because of time zones. But we're certainly getting on with it and just hugely enjoying just immersing ourselves in this literature of place. As to the first part of your question in terms of themes, I think that's a really valid one and a perceptive one because I think undoubtedly our kind of sense of connection with place, our association with the local landscape has acquired added resonance in these current circumstances precisely because the parameters of physical space within which we move are being redefined all the time. Um, I think for me, maybe what current circumstances have underlined is that in this time where we perceive our spatial circumstances in very, very different ways because we're being forced to, I think it can be useful. It can be really useful to look to the past because, of course, historical depictions of the natural world do provide revealing various ways in which land and its features were conceptualized through time. So I think on that kind of level, the key themes of the project are really resonant and relevant in these current times. So the key themes per se mightn't have changed, but I think the importance of understanding the intricate engagement of peoples of the past with their own whereabouts has, for me at least, really been, been brought to the fore. Amazing, Moja. Thank you very much for this. And yes, your research group is really scattered throughout the world, so we have someone in Germany, then of course yourself in Cambridge, and finally someone else down to the far west in California. I think that the multicultural component of your research group brings to another level notions such as belonging, identity and mobility, and COVID-19 allows us to appreciate that in a way that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. I'm not saying there is anything inherently positive about that. COVID-19 is awful and in-person research is much better. In fact, we should hope to get back to that as soon as we can. But since there is nothing we can do to make that happen more quickly, let's move on to the next question instead. Wonderful, Moise. So here's my question for you. Could you tell us how this project is related to your previous work and what exactly inspired you to pursue this line of research? Again, that's a really interesting question. In a way, it goes back to your first question. And when we look back, we can sometimes identify patterns in what we do that aren't clear at the time. I think at the time, we're just moving sometimes from one thing to another, but pursuing our curiosity. I suppose history writing, the genre of history writing lies, I think, at the core of what I do, understanding how medieval people constructed their past and why they did this. I studied propaganda narratives, origin legends, literary narratives as ideological and aetiological constructs. So what I'm interested in 
then is how the world of their authors emerges when we examine how they perceived and constructed their past. So I suppose in many ways, this literature of place that we're now looking at is an extended origin legend of Ireland's landscape. And one overarching question in the context of my kind of previous work is how this interconnected grand narrative of place, how it served historical writing in the period, how it served in the historical enterprise that we see in other kinds of genre as well. So that would be one, I think, connection with what I've previously done. I mean, I think the other is that I've tried as much as I can to situate the textual culture of medieval Ireland in a broader setting in my own work, particularly, you know, I've tried to relate the medieval cultures of Ireland, Britain, Scandinavia to wider European currents. And I hope that this project will be no exception. I mean, this literature of places is very local, but it's also global. I mean, it's grounded, obviously, in Ireland's place and literature, but just as we've been speaking about more generally, it adapts Latinate learning, it adapts classical techniques, for example, to create this etymological epic that's both Irish and European. So I think by looking at it in this kind of wider intellectual context, I hope that it can also tell us a little bit about the broader intellectual culture of medieval Europe and indeed Ireland's place within it. And that also, I hope, fits in with the general currents of previous things I've been doing as well. Wow, fantastic, Moja. Thank you very much for your answer. And I must say that I really like this mutual resonance of local and global. It adds a lot of scope to the historical, literary, and of course, linguistic component of your research. It's just amazing. Thank you. Okay, let's continue with another question now. Topography is very commonly found in archaic literature. For example, you know, I'm thinking about Egyptian literature, or rather Egyptian myth, the Greek literature, and of course, the Bible. This is all the more striking, since these archaic backgrounds are culturally and, you tell me about that, linguistically unrelated. So, in this sense, what is it, Moisha, that makes the Irish experience so, so unique? Topography is so prevalent in all of these very different kind of cultures precisely because our sense of belonging is shaped to some extent by our natural surroundings and because an intimate association with landscape forms a universal of human history. But for all its universality, every experience is unique because it's our own specific connections with particular places, whether as individuals or as communities that feeds into who we are. So in that kind of sense, the Irish experience isn't special. But I think what is remarkable, maybe, is just the extant material surviving from medieval Ireland, which enable us to construct their experience, perhaps in a more detailed way than we can from some other places. Fantastic, Moja. It all makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Now, let's move on to the collection on which your new project is centred, the so-called Dinhenekas Asian. So, as a first general question about the Dinhenekas Asian, could you introduce this collection to our listeners, both in terms of its content, you know, literary or other, and as a physical book in the various manuscripts that have survived from the Middle Ages? Okay, so Din Henechus, which is at the core of this project, is focused on Shenechus, the second part of the word, which in the medieval period referred to a particular kind of learning, knowledge of different types, be it kind of historical, genealogical, legal, and the like. And when we combine this word Shenechus with Din, which is the word for a height or a hill, but it actually came to mean any kind of notable place, it signifies topographical knowledge. And it was conceived as a specific category of learning in the medieval period, and we have it in lots and lots of different kinds of texts. But alongside that, there's this extensive corpus called the Dinhenechus of Ireland, as it were, Dinhenechus Asian, in which Ireland's history is constructed as an overarching narrative of place. And that's what we're focusing on in this project. So just to give your listeners some sense of it, it's a composition in prose and verse of about 10,700 lines. It's got more than 225 poems. It deals with over 200 places and natural features. Much of it was written in the 11th and 12th centuries, but it's drawing to some extent on early material, but it continued to be expanded and reworked down to the 16th century. 
we can't talk about one physical book. In order to get a sense of this corpus, we have to look at over 20 manuscripts. So there are lots of manuscript witnesses. The earliest of these is the 12th century Book of Leinster. But as I say, it continues to be reworked down through the medieval period and into early modern times. So that's the material that we are working with. Fantastic, all very clear, thank you. But what about the relationship between historical works, like, you know, historiography in the proper sense and the Dunhenikas Asian? Are there any dynamics of interdependence, any, you know, relevant interaction that you would like to bring up? I think that's very perceptive to link it with historiography, because in a way, this is the historiography of Ireland constructed through place, whereas we get other grand texts, as it were, other large texts, which tell a continuous history of Ireland using dynasties, genealogies, that kind of thing. So this really is parallel to that in various ways. I mean, I think the other thing is that it was perceived as history, even though it's full of mythological characters. But of course, these characters were also recorded in chronicles. And I think the other thing that's interesting about this material, so that it parallels those kinds of other historiographical texts, but also that there's interconnections between them, because some of the material that we find in this Dinhenochus, in Dinhenochus Asian, or indeed in other kinds of Dinhenochus narratives, some of them we find in chronicle texts, in literary narratives. So I think this intertextual nexus of material also highlights the extent to which in Hennechus is very much part of this broader literary milieu. This comprehensive outlook brings it really all together. Thank you, Moje. Thank you for yet another splendid answer. Now, Moje, could you tell us about the author or indeed authors of the Din Hennechus Asian and about the intended audience of texts belonging to this genre? Well, it's anonymous for the most part, at least, well, there's a pseudo-historical prologue to Dinhenechus Aden, which appears in some manuscripts, and that gives it its context. But of course, that's done for a very, very specific reason. It gives it a specific time and place. It gives it a tempus, a locus, a causa scribendi, these typical parameters of medieval narrative. It says that it was composed by a particular poet who actually fasted so that another character could relate to him all of these stories about the topography of Ireland, and this was supposed to happen in the 6th century during the reign of a particular king of Tara. But that's, of course, the very, very specific etiology, and it's composed after a lot of this material has been brought together. So much of it is anonymous. But there are named historical poets in the collection, and clearly a lot of it is being drawn from the works of people like the late 10th century poet mentioned on quite a number of occasions, Kinedo Hartogan, and there's an early 11th century poet in there, Kuan or Lothgoin, there are some 12th century poets. So clearly there's historical material there, and this material was written by some of these named poets. But as a corpus, then we have to think about it really first and foremost as an anonymous creation. You asked about audience. Well, I suppose, again, we're talking about a corpus that had a long textual history. So an audience for a poem by Kinea the Hartogon in the late 10th century would have been very, very different from the audience, say, experiencing some of this material in the 14th century. It's a learned composition, but that, of course, doesn't mean that these various stories about specific places couldn't have been enjoyed by very many people connected with the place. But it's also a learned compilation for the learned to provide this constructed history of Ireland focused on the landscape, to provide authority, legitimization on some level for a history of place. So that kind of audience, that kind of learned audience, I think would also have enjoyed it. Powers that be, kings and the nobility. Sometimes there are political messages and things very much embedded in this. So I think a variety of changing audiences depending on time and place. What a fantastic answer, Moja. Thank you very much for this. Now, if I may ask a question on the spot, does the number of surviving manuscripts of the Dinhenikas Asian reflect the popularity that it had during the Middle Ages? Is that a relevant proportion, so to speak? Yes. I mean, 
Clearly, we have to be careful in equating number of manuscripts surviving with popularity of a text, because in medieval Ireland, like in so many places, we're dealing with huge numbers of manuscripts that have actually been lost. But relatively speaking, as it were, 20 manuscripts of what's a large collection of material, that's a significant number of manuscripts. So I think we can carefully suggest that that might indicate that this material was very popular and that it was written and rewritten written down through time. I mean, we see that as well when we compare various versions of some of the texts with one another. We see how they're being shaped and reshaped and created and recreated. So yeah, now this was a significant literary monument for a considerable period. Wow, amazing. Thank you. Now, Moise, moving on to something different, did the Dinhenechas Asians serve any practical purposes in the Middle Ages? And conversely, does it serve any practical purposes for us now, today? For example, you know, does it help us to understand the function of some medieval sites or simply to, you know, locate their position within the geography of medieval Ireland? Again, very interesting kind of complex questions. So if we start with this purpose in the Middle Ages, it certainly served a pedagogical purpose, I think. It was a reservoir of environmental knowledge, of knowledge about the landscape of Ireland. I mean, one, I think, indicator of that is its question and answer structure. That would certainly suggest some underlying pedagogy. But I think part of that purpose would be to inform about the present. And I mentioned in passing the political purpose that some of this material has. And in some specific texts, definitely the past and the present are being very deliberately aligned for political effect. It's not a logical itinerary of Ireland. So if you're thinking about, could they go from one place in the Dinhenechus to another and use it as a map of kinds, that's not the kind of text it is. In some regions, some sites like important in mythology and history like Tara are very much to the fore in it, but still there's a huge number of sites throughout Ireland, but it doesn't have any practical mapping purpose or the like. In terms of helping us to understand the function of medieval sites today, working alongside archaeological colleagues in particular, we really can come to a greater understanding of perhaps the continuing use of some sites if we look at the concrete results on the ground and measure those in terms of the ideological perception of the place that is presented in Dinhenechus Asian. Clearly, this is a nuanced approach. But but I think, again, taking a holistic approach to a particular medieval site and drawing on all of the available evidence for that site, again, can only help us understand what was happening on the ground, quite literally, better. That's absolutely brilliant, Moja. Thank you very much for this. Now, let's anticipate the third section of this interview with a question about language, right? In the Dinhenecas Asian, there seems to be a very intimate correlation between space and language, the latter often in terms of etymology. So, Moise, could you elaborate on that and give us a couple of significant examples of this intersection, of this convergence, you know? Etymology is a key part of the corpus, but of course it's medieval etymology, really the tradition of etymologizing made popular by Isidore of Seville. I suppose in Dinhenechus Asian, etymology is one of the ways in which knowledge presented in the corpus is provided with authority, is legitimized. And that's very, very interesting because it means that some place names are given different name etymologies, different explanations, but they're all set out as being true it provides a way of giving layered history of a particular site. So each kind of etymology works in its own interpretative framework. So it adds authority or it lends meaning to the name within its own conceptual construct. So we often get stories which have a sequence of varied etymologies and each of them is associated with their own narrative. You ask for a specific example. Perhaps I might give one associated with quite a famous site, Nauth, which is part of the nexus of monuments around Newgrange in County Meath. In Irish, that's Cnogba. And the first way that that's explained is by pulling the Cnogba apart into Cnoc, which is the word for hill, and then Bua. And Bua is then presented and we get a story about Bua, who is meant to be then the wife of a particular god. So first and foremost, Nauth Cnogba is presented as the hill of this particular mythological woman, Bua. Then a different 
different explanation is given, drawing on other examples from the medieval Irish pantheon. We get a focus on one of the gods, namely Oinrus. He's meant to have loved a particular woman who was then abducted and he goes after her. And we're told that when he was looking for her, he was eating nuts along the way, which he then threw on the ground, lamenting his loss. So this is setting up an explanation of the name Knogba as not wailing, basically. The word for nut is Kno. These are the nuts that Eamrus was eating when he was looking for his beloved. And then he was lamenting her because he couldn't find her. And that's Gova. So these are obviously fanciful, but they are hooks, as it were, on which different stories about the particular place are presented. And I think what's interesting is that, as I say, they are deemed to be equally authoritative. And sometimes we get that very specifically told that this second account or third account or fourth account or whatever is an equally authentic alternative account. So what the authors are doing are deliberately putting these various kind of interpretations side by side, setting out justification for them as being equally valid. And indeed, in the case of Nauth, the author then goes on to record a very, very different story of Nauth again. So what we get then through this kind of legitimizing etymology in Din Henechus Asian is the recollection, the analysis of very many strands of landscape history in turn, all of which, as I say, are equally legitimized. And then out of these various literary strata, this multi-layered memorial landscape history can be formed, but etymology is absolutely at the heart of it, particularly as one of the legitimizing principles behind it. Excellent, Moise. That's very interesting indeed. It's very interesting to see how, you know, an originally laid Latin methodology, I'm talking about Isidore's, became so important in Irish medieval and post-medieval culture. That's really amazing. Okay, so with the last question of this second section, we're back to the 21st century. So here's my question for you, Moise. Are people in Ireland aware of the historical and literary significance of so many places there? Or just a different way of asking the same question, really. Is the Irish government keen on promoting initiatives that encourage people, young people, for example, and, you know, perhaps especially, that encourage them to learn more about their local surroundings, so to speak? Yes, that's difficult to answer. I think there is a deep sense of place. And I think there is a general awareness of stories behind particular places. And there certainly is an interest, like a real and genuine enthusiasm and interest for these particular stories. I know that as part of the school curriculum in the Republic of Ireland in particular, there are things called classroom-based assessments where pupils go and do particular projects. And I know that very often some of those projects are on either their own place or particular things of historical interest in their own place. There is a wonderful site called loganum.ie, which is a site for the place names of Ireland, so where you can go and plot and find something about those various places. And there's a corresponding one for the North of Ireland and the Northern Ireland Place Names Commission under Francis Kane doing really excellent work there. But I'm not aware of government initiatives encouraging people to learn more. But I think there is genuine interest. I hope on some level that if we can, in time to come, communicate the results of our research, like those working on place names in Dublin and indeed, as I say, in the north of Ireland and communicating their research, I, I hope we can increase interest in the topic as well. That was very helpful. And I quite like the idea of research in the humanities having the power to change the way in which certain things are done to challenge people's preconceptions and so on. That's really, that's really how it should be, isn't it? Okay, Moje, we have made it to the end of the second section of our interview, so we're starting with the third and final section after a short break. Here we are. We may now start with the third section of our interview, Moje. So, a few weeks ago, I interviewed your classics colleague at Queen's, James Diggle. James, and I'm saying this for our listeners, James is editor-in-chief of the Cambridge Greek Lexicon, which is coming out in the spring after over 20 years of painstaking work. So, before you leave a human project on the Dinhenekas Asian, which we discussed in detail in section 2 of this interview, before that project, you are co-investigator of a five-year AHRC project titled Text and Meaning for a Revision of the Dictionary of Medieval Irish. 
So just to start off with a general question, could you tell us more about your experience as a part of that project and what it meant to you to be involved in this, you know, one-of-a-kind enterprise, as it were? Um, well, I suppose that immersed me in the wonderful world of Irish words for five years and it was a really great collaborative experience. The director of that project was my colleague from Queen's University Belfast, Greg Toner, and we had a number of researchers, but the principal researcher working through all of the period was Dr. Sharon Arbuthnot. So it was a really great collaborative experience in that way. Over five years, you know, 72 textual editions analysed. 5,000 perhaps changes made in the medieval dictionary of Irish. There were 3,800 or something that were really quite substantive. I suppose linking on from what we were saying earlier about communicating research to a wider audience, one of the things that Greg Sharon and I did towards the end of that project was also wrote a general book drawing on some of the material from the electronic dictionary of medieval Irish, namely a history of Ireland in a hundred words. And that brought us into a different strand of communicating research. And that really was also, I have to say, very enjoyable. And we learned a lot from communicating some key facts about words in that format as well. But the revised electronic dictionary of the Irish language that went live in August 2019, I hope that's a monument to what we achieve over those five years. Wow, amazing, Moji. And for five years, which is, you know, comparatively a short amount of time, I think that monument is really not an overstatement considering how much you've accomplished. You had a wonderful team, obviously, and you worked very well together. Congratulations. And just to say this briefly, I totally agree with you that outreach is crucial and it's a very important set of skills to be able to communicate the deepest significance of your research to people who have nothing to do with your field. And the beauty of it is that sometimes that helps you to be clearer in your academic writing as well. So it's all coming together at some point in some ways, even if, you know, sometimes you have to wait for it. It's not an immediate result, but that counts with time and that's wonderful. That anyway is the effect that uh, outreach has on me and it's reassuring it from my perspective that you're exactly on the same page about this, so thank you. And uh, now I'm going to ask you the same question I asked James a couple of weeks ago. So we were talking about the revision of the Dictionary of Medieval Irish. Could you tell us about one word which you found particularly difficult and, you know, how you tackled it? Oh gosh, I don't know if I can sing. I mean, I will, I will obviously single out, out a single word, but I suppose on some level, I think the really difficult ones are still in a database. They didn't actually make it into the final product and they're still in our working database there waiting for other attestations or whatever. I mean, actually, I think one of the most difficult things, because we were working with a dictionary that's already there and it had in a previous project been put online and indeed revised. But I think one of the most difficult things was when you came across new meaning or new interpretations for words. And you, because of entering those new examples into the dictionary, you had to completely rework the categories of meaning that were there already under a particular heading. Because I think that was actually really difficult because when you're working with a dictionary that's already there, you have to ask yourself, okay, how far should I go to change the things that are there already? But in some cases, just adding one or two new examples brought new meanings to light and illuminated the fact that other examples have been put in the wrong place. In terms of a specific word, it's not that it was particularly difficult, but I think one word which was associated with my own research really exemplified for me some of the cruxes of problems. I mean, there's a word there, stewardess long. So there's a word in the dictionary already, stewardess man, which is an old Norse loan word. It could be an old Norse loan word, or it indeed could have come from English as well. It's kind of a steersman. And then we found a reference to Stuarus Lung, which had been in a poem recently edited by Elizabeth Boyle and Liam Brenach. And they were taking it in a parallel formation, a steered vessel, a ruddered ship or the like. And of course, it could be that. But another way of analysing this Stuarus Lung formation would be to take the first part of it as a verbal formation that steers and then a ship. So we have a word and the fact that there is a parallel formation there already might lead one to put Stuarus Lung alongside Stuarus Man and in effect that's what we did. But sometimes it is difficult to really decide whether it is a compound word or perhaps in effect what we're getting here is a verb and a noun. I don't know if that's very clear but I really really don't think that you can encapsulate it all in one particular word. But as you ask me for a specific one, that one springs to mind because as I say, you know, it's an old Norse or a possible old Norse loan word as well. Well, it certainly made perfect sense to me. So I cannot speak on behalf of our listeners, but it was very clear. And thank you very much for choosing that, Moje. 
All right, so moving on to the next question, we're still talking about words, but in a slightly different way. The two questions, however, are somehow related. So, in your answer, you mentioned old Norse as a possible derivation for the world you described to us. And I've been thinking, are there many old Irish words of known Irish origin? And if so, how do we explain that? Does it complicate our understanding of Irish as a whole, of Irish as a language, you know? Yeah, I mean, there are lots. I mean, Latin, English, Old Norse, French, and of course, the explanation, as you know, is just sustained contact with speakers of these languages in different contexts. So that's one possibility. The other context is that sometimes we can associate particular words with particular branches of learning. So for example, there are lots and lots of Latin loan words that have to do with writing, because of course, writing came with Christianity. Or again, there's a specific medical vocabulary, which again is associated with Latin medical texts and the like. And there's lots and lots of loan words in the dictionary. There were lots and lots of loan words in the dictionary. I think the original the original compilers of the dictionary were actually quite generous in admitting loan words. And indeed, they're still there because we tried not to delete things unless they were wrong, obviously. But in terms of adding loan words, our principle was that if they were being modified in accordance with the expectations of normal Irish grammatical usage, so for example, if they were being nasalized or lenited or whatever, then we included them. And there are some additional Old Norse ones there. We have some new loan words in there. And we also have, again, in this phase, some possible etymologies that link some words to loan words, as it were. Sometimes, actually, it's really, really difficult, particularly with Norse and English, actually. Sometimes it's very difficult to determine whether something that's clearly coming in from a Germanic language, whether it's coming in from Old Norse or whether it's a borrowing from Old or indeed Middle English, if we're going on later. And that's not always, but well, it's never easy to determine. And it's not actually always possible to decide which of those two languages is the donor language, as it were, for a particular word. That's very interesting, Moja. Thank you. Okay, let's talk about something else now. A couple of more general questions, you know, as the interview draws to a close. So, people are often surprised at how different ancient and modern Greek are. That's my experience as a classicist, at least. And I must confess that I don't even speak modern Greek, which is admittedly a shame. You, on the other hand, are a world expert in Old Irish, and as you reminded us at the start of the interview, are a native speaker of modern Irish too. So you are perfect for answering this question. Are there more, you reckon, similarities or differences between Old and Modern Irish? What's your view? There are enormous differences between Old and Modern Irish. Well, I know a little bit of Ancient Greek, hardly any Modern Greek, but I would say that there are greater differences between Modern and Old Irish than there are between Modern Greek and Ancient Greek. Just in terms of verbal morphology, the verbal system of Modern Irish, notwithstanding its complexities, is still much simpler than it was in Old Irish. I think it's also different depending on the dialect of modern Irish, because morphologically, the Munster dialect of Irish is perhaps closer to Old Irish than Northern Irish is. It's been more simplified as far as morphology is concerned. There are clearly many more English loan words than there are, if we want to continue our previous discussion in modern Irish, than there are in Old Irish. Yes, I think speakers of modern Irish are often surprised when they pick up a piece of old Irish, as in particularly anything before 1200. They recognise words, but you couldn't actually understand a text. From post-1200, it gets a little bit easier, but no, if you're a speaker of modern Irish, you can't easily understand medieval Irish. So there it's very, very different, say, from if you're a speaker of Icelandic, then it's very easy to pick up a piece of old Norse. It's not like that in Ireland. Amazing, thank you. Okay, Moise, so let's talk about modern Irish again. This is going to be the last question of this interview. It's a very straightforward question, and I would like to know your opinion as a scholar and as a researcher, of course. So, would you consider today's linguistic monopoly of English an actual threat to the survival of modern Irish? I mean, I suppose the situation, as far as modern Irish is concerned, has changed dramatically. I mean, there aren't any monolingual speakers of modern Irish anymore. And in terms of the Irish-speaking areas, then the number of speakers in those Irish-speaking areas has declined quite dramatically. But the other side of it is that the number of people speaking and engaging with Irish outside of those Irish-speaking areas has increased. Clearly, that's not the same as, you know, living, working in an Irish-speaking community, but it is a different kind of engagement with Irish. 
part of the difficulty is how the language is taught in schools. I think there is, for the most part, a genuine interest and engagement to a certain degree with Irish and a curiosity about it. But most people tend to be turned off in school. And of course, the monopoly of English that you've noted is very much to the fore. In terms of whether it's a threat, I think modern Irish will adapt in certain ways. And I think one of the things that we can do, perhaps as scholars of the medieval period, is to just interest people in the wealth of historical and literary texts and indeed interest them in the wonderful complexities of medieval Irish as well and just the quirkiness of the language and literature of the period. So I suppose that's really all we can do is just try and remind people that in order to understand their history, the further back they go, the more gems they'll find. It seems, you know, appropriate to end this interview on a positive note. That is to say that modern Irish will survive eventually and will still be there for people to speak in the decades to come. And I quite liked your celebration, as it were, of the immense power of the past. That's something we should all bear in mind more often than we do. Thank you, Moje. That was splendid. All right, this is really the end of this interview. So, Moje, thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. It has been so lovely to interview you this morning. I am looking forward to other collaborations with you, who knows, in the future. And in the meantime, good luck to you and your wonderful team. This Live a Hume project is going to be, I'm sure, a huge success. So, thank you very much again and goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Hello people, thank you very much for listening to the second episode of our podcast. If you enjoyed my interview with Moje, please give us a thumbs up or a good score depending on where you're listening to this. And I should remind you that you can find the CMTC podcast interviews both on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Many thanks to the Centre for Manuscript and Text Cultures and to the Queen's College for giving me the time and peace of mind to work on these interviews. Thank you also to Chiara, Pavel, all of my dearest friends really, for all the advice and helpful guidance over the past months. And, of course, recording these interviews has been a pure joy so far, listeners, and that's all thanks to you. So once again, thank you. You're amazing. The super catchy theme song was composed by my friend from Trento, Michele Tazin. Michele is a hugely talented musician, people, so now that you've listened to the podcast, go to Facebook and go to Michele's Facebook page. You will find the link, the same as last time, in the podcast description. Let me stress that we're all a part of this, so if any of you would like to give some advice, some feedback, or, you know, even suggest a speaker for a future interview, please send me an email. My address is gabriele.rota at queens.ox.ac.uk. I'm repeating it. gabriele.rota at queens.ox.ac.uk. And of course, you will find the address in the podcast description, just in case my verbal skills have failed me, which, as you know, is very far from impossible. And lastly, a huge thanks to TDS for providing all the audio equipment for home recording, which is particularly welcome in these times of pandemic, of course. And now, a funny anecdote to end the acknowledgement section. Moise and I recorded this interview on Saturday the 30th of January 2021. On that day, they were dismantling an unexploded bomb from World War II they had found underground in my neighbourhood here in Göttingen. I'm in Germany now, I'm not in Oxford. And we had to delayed the interview quite a bit, as there was no power in the streets, no power in the building, no power anywhere around. So when you think about all the things that can happen to you as you record a podcast, well, I don't think that imagination is a very good limit anymore. Thank you very much for listening, and goodbye. <laughs>